That's another story with us. The Nigerian government has recently filed criminal charges against four crypto dealers and several firms over allegations of conducting financial activities without a valid banking license, including unauthorized USDT to Naira transactions. The Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, claims the defendants were involved in foreign exchange violations, money laundering, and Naira manipulation through cryptocurrency platforms. As legal proceedings unfold, this case highlights growing regulatory concerns surrounding cryptocurrency use in Nigeria and its potential impact on the financial market. Obina Iwuno, CEO and co-founder at CBC Blockchain Services, joins me for this. Hello, Obina. Thank you for joining me today. Hi, thank you. Right, well, some might be wondering if they are getting mixed signals from the federal government on crypto regulation. Do you think so? I mean, what do you have to say about this? I do not think so. I think that the crypto regulation is very clear. The SEC is doing its job, you know, to regulate cryptocurrency. And of course, you saw that with the recent um, issuance of a provisional license to to crypto exchanges amongst the seven firms who have been licensed to offer digital assets as exchanges as um, offering platforms and a custodian. So I don't think that there are mixed signals. Right, let's get into this. I mean, the federal government actually filed um, criminal charges against four crypto dealers and several firms over allegations of conducting uh, the business of other financial institutions without a valid banking license. And that, of course, includes USDT to uh, narrow transactions between 2021 and January 2024. Help us unpack this. What exactly have this, you know, uh, crypto exchanges or firms done? What have they violated so far? Well, I cannot say what they have violated because uh, I'm not party to the um, suits that were inspired. So, but what I could say is that the prosecuting party would have to provide the evidences that these people have violated and what they have claimed that they violated in court. And then it's left for the courts to decide if they did that, you know. So, uh, before you file, um, any suit, there must always be a basis or a, a background. Uh, but yes, it is uh, uh, not guilty on to proven guilty. All right. So, and I think that is the reason why they are going through the court process. So, it is the court who will determine if this is a violation or not a violation. And I believe that a fair process will be, you know used in that uh, suit. All right. I, I totally get what you're talking about. But then looking at the provisions of Section 29, Subsection 1C of the Foreign Exchange Monitoring and Miscellaneous Provisions Act, uh, does the new regulation or guideline for virtual asset trading sort of approve this sort of transaction once the crypto firm in question has a required license? Because they are saying that they don't have the license to, you know, do what they are doing. They, they, they don't have the license to do it. Did you hear me? Well, if, yeah, if it's on the issue of license, so far only seven firms has been given licenses. Before now, there is nobody who had a license whatsoever for any crypto um, business, right? But these businesses have been carried out, okay? So and I do not want to... Uh, think that it is the issue of just um, licensing. All right. The licensings we are just issued recently, and the whole industry is happy that there is a license that have been issued. And we are also asking for more to be issued um, licenses. So uh, we do not want to see a situation where things are done too early before they are matured, right? So I think that what is most important now is, you know, issuing licenses to all of those who have applied, of which uh, the SEC has promised that they are going through all of the applications and licenses will be issued to more um, 
operators who have applied for licenses. So we right, let me come in here, Obina. That, we're look that is all right, let me come in here. I mean, let's look at uh, sections 29, subsection 1C of the Foreign Exchange Monitoring and Miscellaneous Provisions Act, which, of course, is what is in contention here. And what I have here says negotiates um, in relation to part one of this act, a person who, to see now, negotiates any draft, foreign bank note, other foreign exchange, or any other trading instrument otherwise than as permitted by this act, or forges or produces as genuine to the central bank or the market any false document with a view to utilizing the document in any transaction in the market is guilty of an offense under this act. Now, this particular, um, what we have is a situation where we're made to understand that one of the things they have done is to violate section 29, subsection 1C of the Foreign Exchange Monitoring and Miscellaneous Provisions Act. So I am saying that by virtue of the new licensing, the new regulation that we're seeing in this particular space. Do you know or are you aware if these new seven or, or if the seven uh, firms that have gotten licenses have the permission to do this, to carry out foreign exchange transactions? That's the question I'm asking you. I think that for that, it will have to go into what the provisions of their licenses is. And that is an information I do not have. All right, so I will not be able to tell you categorically if they do or they do not. We will have to see what is the provisions in the licenses that was given to them. What does he empower them to do? It's on that basis that you would begin to fault or begin to speak authoritatively on this. And if this is not a public knowledge, then there is very little that we can do concerning it to comment on it. All right, so you can comment on something you do not have. Um, full knowledge of or you do not have before you. So I do not have what the provisions of the licenses are, if that is the question. All right. We will need to see what is in the licenses and what it empowers them to carry out to know if they are in violation of the quoted uh, section or not. All right, that's it, Fexi. But for you, I mean, do you see a situation where crypto exchanges might be required to probably obtain a valid banking license or something that sort of covers them for that, you know, forex trading aspect and all that? I don't think that crypto exchanges need licenses. It's like they are called exchanges. The banks already have banking licenses. So what is needed here is a synergy of the two because they are both complementary. All right. So when the crypto exchanges need financial services, the banks should offer them financial services. If you remember very well, the, in, in February 2021, when um, the former CBN governor released the letter circular, and that circular simply stated that banks should not offer financial transactions to individuals and uh, organizations within in cryptocurrency. Right. So what it means and clearly shows is that it is the place of the bank to offer financial services, all right? So you cannot be issuing um, a crypto exchange, uh, a digital asset license, and also a banking license. That would be like an overload of, uh, um, you know, role. All right, well, let's also look at this. We know that on September 4th, 2024, EFCC secured an order from the Federal High Court to freeze 548.6 million era in bank accounts belonging to suspected crypto users on platforms like BB8, Coin, and others. And that's based on their alleged role in NARA fluctuations. This is one question I have always asked, and I also want to ask you. Can we actually prove that their activities actually play a role in the fluctuation we're seeing in the Nigerian currency, Naira? I mean, how, how does it really impact it? Prove. That may be difficult to prove because you have to show an extent what exactly this person did, you know, to make, contribute to the fluctuation of the Naira. And don't forget, the Naira has also been floated, right? Um, in a free market, the law of demand and supply would always play a role, okay? And this is not the first time that the accounts of uh, crypto traders have been freezed. We've seen that before. So this is like a repetition of the same thing that has been um, done before. So I don't see this as spectacular or, you know, 
it's not a new thing. It has happened before. So this is not the first time it's happening. So if this is the first time it's happening, we would be giving it that attention. Remember in the past, the uh, Abuki FX was blamed for, you know, the rates, right? And Abuki FX was shut down. It does stop the rate from going up and fluctuating. No. So we can't keep having a new person to blame at every time. We should really look at what is the key problem, what is the root cause of this thing. That's what I see from um, what has happened so far. But you know, there are those who are saying maybe we need to make to, to sort of pay more attention to the peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Maybe we maybe some of the things happening there can you know maybe cause an upset. Do, do you think so? Oh well, the peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Uh, I think that what should be done there, there is for it to fall under the regulatory purview, and I think that SEC is also doing something in that regards. I believe that if there are uh, um, licenses issued to crypto exchanges to operate, it would even reduce the need for people to do peer-to-peer -peer because what I see that peer-to-peer -peer signifies is people trading between themselves and exchanging maybe crypto for cash or cash for crypto as the case may be. But when there are regulations and their licenses, just like we have, those kind of activities will be conducted on SEC regulated platforms, all right? And it will reduce the need for peer to peer and uh, pressure. And so these things can be monitored and then gauged to see okay, is this contributing to the uh, fluctuation of the Naira or not? But let's not also forget that Nigeria needs to export more than it's importing, right? So you need to sell more to buy and to end the forests, okay? So because it's an economy that has also come to depend on the global currency in quotes, which is the US dollar. So if you are earning less dollar than you, than you need, there is always going to be a, an effect to that. I, I totally understand. You're saying let's get more structural with this. Let's look at what the issues really are and deal with them rather than always looking for a culprit, someone to blame somehow, you know, whenever we have things like this. But that's enough. Now, to be clear, though, uh, we also have other offenses, you know, that these firms are being prosecuted for, from, you know, money laundering and foreign exchange contraventions, which we already dealt with, to terrorism financing activities on, you know, certain cryptocurrency exchange platforms. I'm just wondering, uh, do you think the SEC guideline and all of that is robust? Bust enough to address these irregularities that we are seeing in this space. One of the one of the reasons for regulations is investor and the user protection. So it covers all of this. And in the stream of the the regulation is not done in isolation. There are also other parties, right? When you're regulated as a uh, platform, there is also the reporting platform, which is like the NFIU. Okay, and I also believe that the CBN will have a role to play in there also, you know, especially when it's being used as a currency or, or a means of a transaction. So all of these regulations put together would take a holistic approach to address these things, right? The reason why some of these regulations are happening is because, one, whoever is doing whatever transactions through any platform, they should be known, all right? Not because you want to broadcast it to the public, but you want to know who is doing what and where it is going so that it cannot be used for such things like you mentioned now, okay? Like money laundering, terrorism, financing. It's a global thing. It's not peculiar to Nigeria, all right? So even those uh, uh, platforms that are being licensed, they are also required to implement an anti-money laundering um, system, you know, a counter-terrorism uh, financing and all of that. So all of these things are even basic requirements before they get the licenses. So you see, that is why it is not going to be possible to do so through regulated license um, operators. And that's why we have been saying, regulate, you know, but regulation should not regulate. All right, we should also understand that um, what we are trying to regulate is in innovation, should not come up with guidelines 
that would strangulate innovation or stifle it. Okay, because that is how the industry is going to continue growing and build a robust sector that can give back to the economy and the country at large. Well, I'm just thinking, you, you talked about regulations should not be strangulation, but do you think the crypto ecosystem is worth all this stress? I mean, if we're going to be, you know, um, clamping down on companies every day, maybe not every day, but if, if, if these companies are not following laid down um, regulations and all of that, do, do we really need to go through all this stress? Maybe we should just say, you know what, we're not doing this again in Nigeria. What's your thought? No. That would be the wrong approach, and it would in turn affect Nigeria in the near future. Uh, the reason is very simple. The cryptocurrency, you know, is a byproduct of blockchain technology. It's an ascent technology, all right? It's an emerging technology. And like all emerging sectors, in their early days, they faced these challenges. Nobody got it right. So some sectors, it took them more than five decades to get it right. So we can't just say, oh, because the crypto, it's something new, all right? So there must also have to be some things that are on trial, all right? So even these um, licenses that are being issued out now, is not yet absolute in the sense that, okay, we are bringing you into that regulatory sandbox to try to carry out these activities and understand this thing better and see areas of improvements, or areas that should be scrapped totally or new things that should be introduced. And this will keep happening for like maybe the next decade too. So we cannot think that we have arrived or we now have a full grasp of um, the blockchain ecosystem because it's technology, it's innovation, it's emotion. By the time you're trying to understand this, or if it was 2017, we would be talking about ICOs right? IEOs, IDOs, all right. So all of those things have changed. Okay. DeFi has come mainstream. What is the regulation for mainstream? Now we are talking of real uh, world asset organization. We are talking of uh, decentralized fiscal infrastructure networks. There are non-fungible tokens NFTs. So, and these things did not exist 10 years ago. So regulation will still continue to be fine-tuned. Because as long as it's a technology sector, there will be constant innovation and you cannot stop people from innovating. So what the regulators need to do is to continuously, continuously stay up to date, stay in the trend, work with the stakeholders, the practitioners, the experts in the industry so that they can always know what is happening and whatever new development is coming. All right. So we cannot say, oh, we we would get regulation perfectly now. It's, it doesn't happen anywhere. Even in the banking sector, they didn't get regulation over. They keep regulating. Even in this modern time, we still keep hearing of new regulations. We still keep hearing of new guidelines of new circulars. So okay. the crypto ecosystem is not, is not uh, different. In fact, it's an ecosystem that uh, attention should be paid to because it holds immense benefit if it is well harnessed. Right, Obina Iwuno, CEO, co-founder at CBC Blockchain Services. Thank you for your time and your thoughts on the show today. Thank you.